Hello guys, Gemma Fisher here from Daybreak Dogs in North Somerset. Was originally planning on doing this broadcast from my puppy pen, for, so for those of you that jumped on earlier, um, yes, I, I'm sorry, we had some connection issues and uh, and also based on my fellow presenters um, uh, making a lot of noise in the background playing, I thought it was better to um, to, to hide up in my office and, and, um, and do the broadcast here instead. So, Today's broadcast is, um, a, is, is it's kind of um, it's a series of questions that I've had this week and they are all based around how do I get my dog to stop doing something. Now, I'm hanging out a lot in the Puppy Diaries, the Facebook group where um, people are following the progress of my puppy, Toddy. Um, and you're more than welcome to join us there. You just simply have to um, type in the Puppy Diaries, Elmsley Hot Toddy, and uh, click to join the group and we will, we will add you to that group. That's not a problem. Um, but as I say, I'm getting um, lots of puppy based questions in there um, because people are obviously following the progress of my puppy with their own and they're, and they're asking questions as we go along. And um, as I say, uh, in addition to questions there about how do I stop my puppy biting, how do I stop my puppy chewing, that sort of thing, you know, baby, baby puppy things. I've also um, done consultations this week or seen clients this week where people have said to me, how do I get my dog to stop barking at other dogs? How do I get my dog to... Um, stop lunging towards other dogs those sorts of things so before I get um, started on the on the questions of the the puppy biting and the um, and the uh, chewing problems um, I'm just going to talk a little bit broadly about my philosophy in terms of when I want my dog to stop doing something now um, traditionally if we want our dog to stop doing something, we tell them off and the, the telling off um, may involve some sort of, um, for example, with lucid walking, it might involve something like a choke chain. Um, if a dog doesn't come back when it's called, um, people do use things like shock collars, that sort of thing. Those are what we describe as adversives in dog training. And those adversives, um, they may stop the behaviour. Um, initially, though what happens when we when we stop behaviour is that it may come out in other areas. So there may be something else that the dog comes up with, which we don't like either. So then we have a new problem that we have to deal with. Um, but the thing about adversives that I'm not keen on at all is that it can make our dogs unpredictable in terms of their behaviour. So for example, with the, the shock collar, um, which fortunately they're not legal in this country, but if anybody's watching um, from outside of the UK, you will know that, that, that you possibly can use shock collars in other, other areas of the world. The thing with something like a shock collar, or um, I've seen electric fence um, type collars, um, where it's an invisible fence line, and basically something is put into the ground, and if the dog crosses a certain point, then uh, they get a shock around their, their collar. So horrible, horrible things, but... Uh, an example of a, an adversive and the problem with any sort of adversive is um, your average pet dog trainer finds positive reinforcement training difficult because they don't have great timing so my concern with any sort of adversive is if somebody is using that and they don't have great timing then not only is the dog getting punished as opposed to being reinforced for for something it could be doing instead but potentially you think that you are um punishing them for um i don't know something like um going uh, over the fence line for example with our with, with our invisible fence line but the problem is that anything that was happening in the environment at the same time that the dog got that shock around its neck that will also potentially be being punished too. So if, for example, you have a lovely friendly dog and they see some children going past and they want to go out and say hi and they have one of these shock collar things on and they run towards these children and um, as they get to, to that fence line, that invisible line that they can't see, then they get a shock around their collar as they're looking at these children. Now, especially with with that particular example how does the dog know that it was the the going out of the the um, garden that caused the shock well how do they know that that was the reason why they got punished and that's the difficulty guys adversives are a problem because we can't always guarantee that the dog understands what they are being punished for so sometimes you are sometimes you'll be punishing for the thing that you you think but other times you won't be and that's why it's potentially so dangerous now the thing about positive reinforcement based training is um, for example if I'm using a clicker and I click at the wrong time do you know what the worst thing that happens to my dog is they get an extra treat 
sucks to be them, doesn't it? So um, the thing about positive reinforcement based training is, do you know what? There is less likelihood of things going wrong, but particularly in terms of your relationship with your dog. So the trouble is with anything where we are looking to punish or we're looking to tell something off that eats into that relationship we have with that person, with that animal. And um, and I, for one, when I'm having a bad training session, because you know what, the best of us have them. We have sessions where we just think this is just not going well. And I start to get grumpy and I start to get a bit fed up. I stop myself and I remind myself that actually I love this dog that I'm working with. And normally the reason that the session isn't going well has absolutely diddly squat to do with them. It has, uh, there are other pressures going on in life that cause me to be um, tired or grumpy. So, um, as I say, what we want to do is we want to aim for everything, all interactions with our dogs being a positive thing so that our dog looks to us as a safe space and um, somebody that they can trust with reliable information. Um, uh, you know, the, the thing about, can you imagine from the dog's perspective, we can be seen as very unreliable if we punish them for things because they, they may not understand what they are being punished for and then we out of the blue come down on them like a ton of bricks and they don't know why that happened so we think that we are being very fair and very you know um uh, good good trainers when we're quite often not and i found this out once actually i went in and did a demonstration at my children's school and we played the human clicker training game which, by the way, guys, is a lot of fun if you've had a few glasses of wine. So that could be your Friday night's entertainment sorted. Um, but here's the thing. The clicker game with people is you um, maybe have a bunch of people together. And what you do is you send one person out of the room and uh, the rest of the bunch of people come up with some behaviour that you want the person to do. Like maybe turning on the light switch or, um, I don't know, sitting down on a chair. Something like that. And... Um, here's the interesting thing that I'm doing this at my, um, my children's school and the behavior that the children and I have decided is that the teacher, we're going to train her to go and turn off the light switch. So I'm clicking as she moves towards the light switch. But do you know what happened at the same time as that? The children were very, very excited by this, as you can imagine. And, um, the children started to move around and she started to follow them. And what happened was when we finished the exercise and obviously she's able to give me verbal feedback, unlike my dog, she thought that she was being um, reinforced, being clicked for, moving around, following the children. Now, I was clicking her for the direction going in towards the light switch, but she was getting something completely different from it. So it's just a fun example, but an example of how if like if we can get it wrong as humans, but the humans can then explain back to us, can you imagine how it is from our dog's perspective? So that even the best trainers in the world can have that. And and with positive reinforcement based training, I say, worst thing that happens is dog gets an extra treat. And that's not the end of the world, is it? But if we potentially shock our dog or we punish them for something that, you know, our timing was not good on, as I say, that can really damage our relationship. So it was something I'd, I'd be heavily encouraging you not to do. If you want to stop your dog doing something, then look to teach it something instead. So, for example, this week, um, as I say, the, the question that, that started me off on this um, train of thought was, um, how do I stop my, uh, my puppy biting? Okay, because we've got some very bitey puppies. Um, and also chewing all and sundry. Now, the thing about puppies is, um, for the most part, things like this, they, that there is a, that there is a certain amount of stuff that they will grow out of in that respect, simply because at this point in their life, when puppies are growing, their mouths are hurting because they, um, their, their adult teeth are coming through. So to a certain extent, this will get better over time, but when it's actually happening and happening and you're in the middle of it, you do need solutions for it. Now, my solution for biting and chewing is, um, uh, first off with biting is to try and alleviate the pain. So in some way using something like a frozen Kong or um, ca cold carrots from the fridge, something like that, to alleviate the pain in the, in the puppy's gums. But here's the thing, not all biting is about the fact that their mouths hurt. Sometimes it's about the fact that they're a puppy and as a puppy, they don't have such long attention spans as our adults and they get tired and they get cranky and they get a bit fed up with um, with uh, with things. And this is particularly so if you, um, this week I've been busy socialising um, and habituating um, Toddy to the, the, the rest of life. So we've done things like we've popped along to our local garden centre and we've wandered around there and he's come along to training classes and he's met 
met people. Um, he's, he's seen children coming out of school, that sort of a thing, okay? Now those things for my adult dogs are everyday boring occurrences because they've been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. But from your puppy's point of view, it's a bit like me going to somewhere like Crufts. So I don't know if any of, be, any of you have ever been to Crufts, um, but Crufts is like this amazing um, sensory experience with things going on in all directions, um, uh, trade stands everywhere. Just It's a really cool, buzzy place to be. But um, by lunchtime, I, ha I normally have a headache and I'm ready to go home because I'm tired and I've just found it all a bit too overwhelming. Now, that's what it's like for our puppies because our puppies are seeing all of this for the first time and they at that age are not able to block out some of that sensory information that they they are being bombarded with so um, they are likely to get more tired more quickly so for you you might be taking them in your arms for like a half hour trip around the 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 town and it like of course, it doesn't doesn't necessarily wear us out. But from our puppy's perspective, they then need to go back and they need to process that information and assimilate it in their in their consciousness. OK, so the way that they do that is that they have to rest. But puppies don't tend to go. Oh, do you know, I'm feeling really tired now. I think I'm going to just take myself off to my bed and I'm going to have a sleep. No, what normally happens is puppies start to get wound up. They start doing puppy zoomies um, and they generally start to be a bit of a pain actually and um, can be quite annoying when they're getting quite tired. Now um, my solution to this is is to say right okay we're going to go off to our crate, we're going to go off to our puppy pen and we're going to have a bit of a nap and uh, then puppy settles down and goes to sleep. But I hear you cry. What happens if I put my puppy in a pen or I put my puppy in a crate and then I get a whole new set of problems because what happens is they start barking, they start howling and generally, you know, kicking off for being um, put away from, from everything. So here's the thing. I don't just shove my puppy in a pen. I don't just shove them in a crate. What I do is I teach them how to be settled in that space because then it becomes a place where they can go and rest as opposed to somewhere where... Um, uh, on the very first day that Toddy came back, Toddy did whinge and whine a little bit in his crate on the way home because, of course, he that was the first time he'd been in, in this crate. And as I jokingly said to him, I know, it's awful. These people have stolen you and, and we put you in pu puppy prison and it's awful and it's, it's terrible. Um, and that's how it was from his perspective. He was like he'd been taken from his litter mates, he'd been taken from his mummy and he'd been put in this strange pen with admittedly some toys. But you know what? He didn't know what was going on. So over the over the, the few weeks that I've now had him, what we've been doing is we've been working on um, puppy pen. Puppy crate is a really cool place to be. Um, one thing about setting up your puppy pen in your crate is try not to set it up somewhere that is like two miles away from everything else that's happening in the house. So I've been over and I've done home visits with people where they set up a crate and it's really cosy and it's a lovely den but it's in the utility room and everything else is happening in the family room, the dining room etc etc but um, puppy is, is effectively from their perspective being banished and puppies are likely to kick off at that point because they are feeling very anxious about the fact that um, that they've been put away and, and um, they don't know what's going on. So um, in my ideal world, I have a, a couple of places. We have a crate in the front room, we have a crate in the dining room, and I have a crate um, upstairs in my bedroom where Toddy is sleeping at the moment. And um, I've got these spaces that are safe places where I can leave him, where he is safe to chew those things that have been left in the crate or left in the pen and um, and also I know that he's not going to be chewing on electrical wires or um, maybe plastic that might get caught in his throat or anything like that so they are safe spaces where I can um, put him and I can put my mind at rest and, and think that he's okay but also he hasn't just been um, put out of the way and banished away from everybody else that in actual fact um, when he goes into a crate or goes into a pen it is with people or his brothers and sisters um wandering around and things so it isn't it isn't we've been um we've been banished from the rest of the world so um so that's one of the things where you set up your puppy pen or you set up your puppy crate um secondly when you put your puppy into your pen or your crate um Toddy now loves getting into his crate in the car. And I tell you for why, every time that puppy has ever got into his crate, as I've gently lifted him in, 
Immediately following that, I've gone into my pocket, I've grabbed some puppy biscuits, I've grabbed some ham, I've grabbed some chicken, some liver cake, whatever it is that I have on me, and he has a scattering of that as well. Now, I learned this from um, dog training um, guru Susan Garrett. Um, it was actually kind of Linda Orton Hill had noticed that Susan does this with her own dogs, that what she would do is when she had finished training one of them and she was putting one of them um, into a pen for a rest, that instead of just putting them in their pen, closing the door and, and wandering off, she would actually throw in a bunch of um, treats what she would call um, an Easter egg hunt, which is something that my boys and I love to say. So we chuck in a load of treats and we're like, Easter egg hunt! And, and puppy gets to snuffle up the biscuits. So by the time the puppy has kind of snuffled up the biscuits, they've sniffed around, they settle down, and... Um, and we've kind of gone off and we, we, we've done whatever we need to do. But the puppy is not really stressed about, oh my goodness, you're leaving me. Okay, So that's really, really helpful um, to help build a bit of value for, for your crate or your pen. Um, uh, thirdly, sort of obvious things, have things in there that your puppy wants to be playing with. And one thing I would suggest is that you might look to circulate things as well. So just like children get bored of toys, um, circulating puppy toys in the in the puppy pen is a really good idea. Um, one of the things I always find really funny when I bring home a puppy is that all of the toys that are more puppy based appropriate, i.e. they wouldn't stand up to rough and tumble play with my adult dogs, but they're perfect for puppies because they're really nice and soft, is that all of the adult dogs want to be puppies again and they want to get into the puppy pen and they want to get into the crate and things. Um, so... Um, Try and try and um, circulate the things that are in there so it ke keeps it interesting. And they don't have to be expensive puppy toys either, guys. It can be um, toilet rolls, um, empty toilet rolls. It can be, um, you know, kitchen rolls because you might be getting through some kitchen roll with a puppy. Um, it's things where they can just chew. They can alleviate that need to be chewing at this age. And um, and it's just interesting things that are in their, in their pen. Uh, one of the things that we have in Toddy's pen at the moment is um, we have some cardboard boxes and he's able to chew on the cardboard boxes and we put some treats in there maybe to find and things as well so he's kind of got lots of enrichment and, and things going on in there so being put in there is not suddenly being taken away from all the good things in his life but actually there's quite kind of quite a, a, a lot of stuff going on in there too so um uh, lastly just on on the uh, the puppy pen crate thing try not to just um uh, for the first few times that you pop your puppy in their pen try not to um, just wander off completely. What I tend to do when I first have a puppy, as I have done with Todd, is I find myself something to do in the same room that I'm popping them in their crate or popping them in their pen. And, oh, and here's the thing as well. So I know lots of people that do use crates or they do use pens, but they tend to only shut their puppy in at night time. And, um... Toddy is shut in whenever I, he is not being supervised and that is for his safety as much as it is um, from, from sort of my peace of mind point of view because of course puppies can do things like, as I, say, as I was saying before, chewing wires, um, finding plastic bits that they shouldn't be, um, uh, wasting their house training lessons too because if a puppy is unsupervised and they need a wee, they're just going to go for a wee whereas if they are enclosed in their puppy pen, at least if there are any accidents you've got it easy to clean up but also potentially they're less likely to do so where they are sleeping as well so you're keeping up your house training lessons too um but when you first put them in there you know what it's a big scary world out there when they when puppies first come home so try and find something you can do in that room so i will maybe find something to do on my laptop and i will sit in the dining room with him when he's in his puppy pen or um I don't know, uh, like in the car, I will, um, e even if I'm, I am headed out, I'll just maybe sit there for a few minutes before I head off, something like that. So it's, it's the key thing is that puppy knows that being put in the puppy pen, being put in the crate is not a punishment. It's not social isolation. It's just, you know what, sometimes I go in here and I have a bit of a relax and um, then I come out again, you know, recharge, ready to go again. And... Um, the thing about this, and I know for Todd at the moment, who is going to be 10 weeks on Saturday, it's just normal. It's just part of his everyday routine. So if you try and do this with a six-month-old puppy that's never had this done, then in actual fact, yes, they may well kick off quite a lot more than he is at the moment. But that's because it's just part of, as I say, his regular everyday routine. So when you're doing it with a, an older puppy or you're maybe bringing a rescue into the house, I would suggest that you are looking um, to, to do a little bit more, play something um, like Susan Garrett's Crate Games, um, you can get that DVD on Amazon. It's really easy to get hold of. Um, but there's some really fun games in there. Or playing um, training games in the puppy pen. Um, playing uh, games with the crate. So um, 
doing things like if you can hop into your crate then you can have your breakfast in the morning so lots and lots of good stuff happens in these places and they're not the end of the world to go and to go and relax in and go and chill out in all right so in doing all of this what you get is you 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 practice good behaviors you practice um uh, things going well puppy is set up to succeed because as I say toddy at the moment you know what he can be a brat like everybody else if you're in the in the puppy diaries you'll have seen a video where um, he's biting and he's chewing he's actually starting to hump my arm because he's very very tired and he, he needs a bit of a nap and I show you how I just kind of you know help him out with that I just help him calm down and then he goes off to his puppy pen and then when he comes out again he's nice and we want to be around him and the other dogs don't want to eat him because um that he's biting at them or, or chewing on them and that sort of thing so um it's really good for creating family harmony just making sure that that puppy is having enough rest as you go through the day and it's amazing really how much rest um, puppies and adult dogs do need so um, don't underestimate that yes exercise is an important part of the puzzle but so too is rest they do need that rest in order to be able to um, to recuperate okay right just gonna have a quick look because um, I f saw a few um, comments come up so let's just have a quick look um, oh hi Lisa hello haven't seen you in a while um, really good advice would love to learn how to train with a clicker do you know anyone that runs a course or classes near or in Bristol do you know what um, Lisa I think I probably do know a few people so what I will do is I will um, have a look at them when I come off the broadcast I'll have a look and I'll see if I can post some links in the comments below so yeah absolutely um, because clicker advice um, clicker training is um, it's really good fun um, and uh, you can you can do a lot of trick training and that sort of stuff with that um, okay so Emma in my local park we have flower and veg beds about 50 centimeters high my 19 week old pup is jumping up on them and he isn't coming back to touch or off I think he knows he shouldn't be up there any ideas okay so um, what I would suggest is that in actual fact you train something that means that it's incompatible so yes there is the touch or there is the off but I would imagine at this point that your puppy, um, Emma, is really enjoying the attention of you getting all flapped and, oh, you know, come off, come off, come off. So what I would do is I would um, be ready for that. So as you start to come close to that area, maybe you start doing some off lead heel work. OK, so you start rewarding him for being close to you and you move on past that particular area. Um, or you ask him to lie down and maybe do a settle and you reward him for, for lying down and doing a settle by there so that there is a... Um, there is a behaviour that what you, that that replaces the behaviour you don't like. Um, so, for example, the other day when I was um, sat eating my lunch, um, uh, it was some soup, and Toddy apparently wanted to get up and get into the soup. All I did was I pulled a bed close by and I asked him to settle on the bed. I had some treats next to me um, while I was having my lunch and I was just dropping some treats down for being on the bed as opposed to trying to get into my soup. OK, so it's basically finding something which is incompatible with the thing that you don't like um, and then really rewarding that heavily. Um, I posted a video fairly recently on the main Facebook page, um, which I'll maybe see if I can put a link to in the comments. Uh, people are often surprised at what I mean by a high rate of reinforcement. Um, you know, two or three treats doesn't cut it. If I, if I want my dog to do something really, really well, um, one of my uh, vodka, my, my uh, 22, 23 month old border collie, you know what? She's amazing now. She can sit on, a, on an agility table watching her sister work. Not always quietly, admittedly. I'm working on the quietly. Um, but she can stay on that table whilst other things are going on. And But she must have had thousands and thousands of treats for being settled on a table um, to start with when there was nothing else going on then gradually increasing the, the the distractions that were going on in the environment so find something that he he basically he cannot be doing at the same time as jumping up on those flower beds um, but keep me posted let me know how you got on um, because um, yeah that can be a bit of a tricky one right okay oh perfect great I'm glad that's helpful Emma so all right we're gonna leave it there for today um, the um, as I say, the basic premise of anything, when, when, when you are thinking to yourself, how do I stop my dog doing X, Y, Z, I want you to think about what they could be doing instead. Because if they are doing something um, that you can reinforce them for instead, then that will get better as opposed to the thing that you didn't like. So 
toddy already, um, I say 10 weeks old on Saturday, he is actively going and finding a bed. When we sit down to have something at the dinner table, he is actively looking to go and get onto a bed, um, just as all of my adult dogs do, because that's the place where you are most likely to be reinforced whilst there is dinner going on. So begging around at the table doesn't get you anything, but getting onto a bed, that gets mum really excited and she starts chucking food around and it's brilliant. So. So bear that in mind when you are looking to um, to change something. Uh, when you have that thing in your head, oh, how do I stop them? I say, think of an alternative that they could be doing instead. In think whenever you think stop, think teach. Okay, so instead of how can I stop, think how can I teach? What can I teach instead? Okay, and that should solve an awful lot of um, awful lot, a lot of your problems. Um, but if you have some specific things that you are struggling with, please do. I'm happy to uh, to answer them in in one of our Friday Fisher fixes. So just pop a comment um, either in on this thread or potentially just post one on the um, on the Facebook page, and I will absolutely look to to get round to answering that. Um, so I think that's pretty much us done for the day. I think I've covered all the bits and pieces that I wanted to cover for today. What I would like to um, ask you to do, if you haven't already, is go to the main Facebook page and there's a sign up button there. And my plan is, I don't always get around to my plans, but I'm working on it. But my plan is to um, try and give people advance notice of what I'm going to be talking about in these Friday Fisher Fixes, but also to get in touch with you and have you chuck questions at me so that I can I can get on board and answer them for you um, because that's what I want to do I want to be able to help as many um, dog owners who are struggling with things as I possibly can um, because uh, I love living with my dogs I really enjoy them uh, but I do understand when they are being annoying um, it can it can interfere with the with the relationship and I'm really lucky I have a whole um, uh, you know a whole library of knowledge in my head that I can draw upon but I know that if, especially if you're a new dog owner it can be really hard what do I do with this dog that that um, is causing uh, causing these problems so by all means um, sign up to that on the uh, on the Facebook page and then we will be able to keep in touch that way as well um, I think that's pretty much it for today so all that left all that is left to be said have a lovely lovely weekend with your dogs enjoy your dogs and I look forward to seeing you all next week for next week's Friday Fish Fix Okay, take care. Bye-bye.